Alright. Uh, any of you guys into stuff at all? Do you like stuff? <laughs> Prior to the 1980s, there was actually very little stuff. Uh, in fact, I, I guess really what it was was people just kind of reading their Bibles by candlelight. Um, but then, in the 1980s, a thing emerged. It was called Night Flight. And suddenly it just showed that there was more stuff than anyone realized. And it was basically it was an aggregation of all of the things that were fascinating and interesting and unknown and waiting to be discovered by people like us, the types of people who showed such an interest in good stuff that this show got moved out of the small theater and into the big one, so Batman and Superman have to fight in that little room. <laughs> because you guys are great. But the person who visualized and actually executed this incredible collection of wonder and impossibility is actually here with us. He has flown out from New York to share with us all of his insight and his experience and everything that made Night Fight what it is. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stuart Shapiro. Thank you. I'm really excited. This is a spiritual reaffirmation of uh, time and space that we all experienced in the 80s. And uh, when Ronald Reagan was in his prime. Reagan! <laughs> Before George Bush, or George H. found um, Cheney to be his loved one. Anyway, this is uh, Born Again. It's a best of. It has some delicious moments, and, and you know, there's so much in the Night Flight Library for us to try to put this into a 90-minute special. It's a, it's a taste, and I hope you enjoy it. I'm here for questions and ask, answers afterwards. I'm really happy we're here. I love the Alamo, and. You know, you are night flight. Night flight is is really poor work. It's it's really a, a generational sensibility. I use the word DNA. <clears throat> we all share this DNA. It's um, it's cutting edge. It's cool. It's being different. It's recognizing that you actually are different, and that you're keeping your individuality. And we were able to actually make that part of a, a long form program. So thanks for being here. Hope you enjoy it. I'm here for afterwards. How did the archive get started? Was this an accident? Was this a like an innate mission that you had in your voice? Oh, uh, not the archive. How did I? Right, right. But how did all you know? How did this best day? Um. Well, let's see. It's uh, the uh, show to begin with when I started in 1981 was an outgrowth of a theatrical distribution company I had called International Harmony. And in the 70s, what we're experiencing here was a very common thing at midnight movies around the country. The difference was that we were going to get fucking high in the movie theater. Nobody stopped you from smoking. You didn't have to it was very open. And we were doing literally hundreds of dates of midnight movies and a lot of more the rock and roll films and the horror films. And at that time, when they say that it was just starting, cable was just starting, they were literally going off the air at 11 or 12 o'clock at night. So I realized that there was this undeserved audience that really wanted a countercultural experience. And that there was all this wonderful entertainment out there. So it was a logical extension for us. And we were lucky we went to the USA Network. And they were actually playing reruns of women's tennis at 11 o'clock at night. Give me a couple hours. Yeah, they did. Very lucky. Two hours went to two hours on Friday and Saturday night, and four hours to eight hours. And, you know, we were really just lucky. It was uh, it was the, the, the birth of cable, and we were free to be able to put anything we wanted on. And I just kind of believed that it was a spiritual uh, journey to provide the culture that really existed out there. That maybe in some cases, you know, being a New Yorker it was a little bit more common. But you know, I always believe that there's um, a wide range of entertainment that doesn't get played, doesn't get seen. So Nightlight had a wide palette to be able to do that, and we were lucky. And we stayed on here for a long time. The library was traveled around. I left Nightlight in 1986. Um, I was really kind of like ran away from it. I 
um, we were living by um, for real. <laughs> a different way. And I ran away from it. And the library kind of wandered around and got stored here and there and stored there. But all the individual, original, original masters stayed intact. And then, uh, and just in the last few years, it really became um, financially possible and technologically possible to start our own channel. That's why we started nightflight.com as a video blog six months ago in May. And then just this last month, we started Nightflight Plus. And it's really, you know, it's kind of like in a, in a way, and I look at these dates, you see 1983, like 30 years ago. It's like so hard to imagine that it's like so old. But I think that we're in the, on the verge of a, of, a, of a sort of channel revolution that's similar to what it was in the early 80s, and that we really have the ability to start a network and have no censorship, and nobody telling you how long it has to be or what you want to put on. So the timing is, is perfect, and you know, with the support of everyone, and it's been great, people, I mean, we're only a month old in terms of and the response of it has been fantastic. And the library is huge. We have over 350 interviews that we did in the eight years. They were all shot on one inch. They're all long form. You're seeing like snippets here. And then every single show had these half hour pods and heavy metal heroes and literally have hundreds of them. So it's really going to be a, a fun journey um, to, to bring the archive out. And then there's so much more great stuff. I mean, uh, just like the fantastic uh, festival that's coming up is a, is a good example. Uh, I'm sure you can't see all the films that you want to see, but I expect that that's the kind of thing that we'll be able to provide on, on Night Flight as an archive to be able to actually have a place so you can really go and have both new films and old films. You already had like Forbidden Zone and stuff like that on there. Like yeah, the Forbidden days. Zone, man. It was like this, uh, it was, to me, Forbidden Zone was like this whole idea that you can have a, uh, an, an arc where life kind of repeats itself. Forbidden Zone was a film that we put on 30 years ago, and then we had the opportunity to, when we started Night Flight Plus, to put it on again. And that was like really kind of rewarding for me to see the circle continue. You talked about how you are going to be able to not be encumbered by censorship, you just put anything you want on there, and that made me wonder, you were playing stuff on basic cable and on syndicated TV, what was the one clip that you caught the most shit for, or one of them that you caught a lot of trouble well, for? Yeah, you know, it's kind of a funny story. So when, when uh, Night Flight started, it, it, for those of you who maybe sort of remember in a sense, but there was, when cable started, there was only one transponder. So the transponder is where they put the uplink, that's like the satellite transponder. So when we went on the air in New York at 11 o'clock, it was actually 8 o'clock in, in Los Angeles. So we went to do New Wave Theater, it was so hard and so rough, it was always the last half hour of night flight, but what I always kind of thought was funny was that it was actually almost prime time in Los Angeles. So for the first two years, I actually almost literally took the one inch tapes and drove them out to the uplink and they put them in there. And, you know, they could just, if they could roll in commercials, they could have the time, to, they, they couldn't even figure out how to roll them in. So we had, there was literally no one between my team and putting shows on the air except for one time, the film Rude Boy, which is a film that I had distributed theatrically, and I, we were getting so much, there was so much going on, we really weren't looking at stuff. Well, there's a scene in Rude Boy where I think it's Joe Strummer's getting a blowjob in the bathroom. <laughs> and um, there's a night flight. And I, was, I come in on Monday morning, and there's like a little stack of, like, do you know what was on night flight this weekend? No. And the guy's getting a blowjob on night flight. That was the beginning of censorship from the USA Network. So it sort of got a little bit downer and downer. And then, you know, cable, cable started to mimic. The, the original inspiration of cable was alternative programming, alternative television. But uh, they all kind of just wanted to be CBS and NBC. So it, it, it eventually kind of preempted itself and, and sanitized itself, which we have to do today. With one exception, I, I, I must say it's kind of funny. So, um, Night Flight Plus is on Roku, not on Sensor, they don't give a shit what you put on today. So I put, uh, I, I, been, so I submitted it for Amazon Fire TV for the last month, and they just came back to me on, uh, last week, and they said they, they rejected it because the, there's 
nudity on the films and Gigi Allen and you know punk shit. They said we're a family channel. You can't put this. So we're actually, you know, when you do get Amazon, it won't be the full version. So, you know, the networks do have their name ups. So there's no nudity allowed on any Amazon? I, I don't know, but they view themselves as a family channel. I mean, and then someone said, well, they transistors or tran transgender is not necessarily family, but they don't want nudity. So there'll be a, a more of a, a white box version of the well, if you ever see any nudity on any film or television <laughs> show ever, please call your local senator immediately. Hey, by the way, did you realize that, that was Al Franken? Yeah. Yeah. Man, Al Franken was ripped. Like, he was in good shape. <laughs> and he had, like, Actually, a, I, you know, I work in Washington, and Al's not happy at all about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time I see him, he's like... You have that early Henry Rollins long hair, too. Yeah. Good look. Um, Man, Mel Franken, I like these with twinkie lips. Does anyone have a question? <laughs> yes. Uh, um, you know, I like to call the uh, beginning animation of life like the freak seeking missile. Yeah. Does it always seem to, and then you talked about in the intro how uh, it shows us the little dog, right? And it really, to me, it kind of puts on the question that it showed me that this kind of thinking of the little dog that I saw in the dead up there. And so I'm thinking, growing up in the 80s, and as I'm looking back, we made it so fun when we really became curated. And so that was one of the first Can you guys hear that? Uh, he wants to, he, I guess the question is, you know, we're, there's so much out there, how do I feel about YouTube? Um, I, uh, I think YouTube, well, um, I think YouTube is uh, like anti nightclub because YouTube is really not curated. It's whatever, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a big wasteland of a lot of shit. On one, on another hand, you can put anything up there, and that's very democratic, totally anarchistic in its sensibility, and that's wonderful. And that's one of the things that's fantastic that you have. We live in an age today that you can have self-expression and in an instant put it on, on the internet. So that I, I think that's wonderful. As far as um, night flight, you use the word curating. It's curating is the essence. You know, ultimately, we only have a certain amount of time, and you want something. To, or somebody or a team to kind of curate and help navigate, clean out all the shit to give you an opportunity for the cream that rises up. So um, I don't believe that YouTube has accomplished that. But on the other hand, I think YouTube has accomplished uh, extraordinary freedom for expression. I don't know if that's necessarily answering your question, um, but I. I'm not per putting Nightblood on, on, on YouTube, but kind of, we don't have a YouTube strategy for it at this point. YouTube's full. <laughs> <laughs> we have another, I saw another hand somewhere in there towards the back. Oh, over here. Uh, I particularly remember watching that um, Winnie Bruce clip, and it seemed to play rather frequently, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I love it. How, how did you like, determine frequency? It seemed like that's the one that was about to do this all along. Well, I mean, you know, Lenny Bruce is cute. That, that piece is just, it's classic. Um, it's, uh, um, you know, it's Lenny Bruce. Um, you know, I think Lenny Bruce in his day was, uh, you know, uh, the essence of night flight and that, that, that piece. Thank you, Mass Man, is, you know, it's really bold. It's bold today when you look at it in a sense, you know. So 30 years ago, it was really Bruce. And, you know, when we put something like that on the air, no one would dare do that back then. So, and it's special. And it's, you know, it's animation, it's great in comedy, and it's rude, and it's, it's um, so, you know, we probably, and it's short, right? It's 11 minutes, actually, so kind of cut quite a bit out of that. But, you know, it's kind of, I, I find fascinating um, when something like Lenny Bruce holds up. You know, the thing that's really, I'm finding exciting about the Nightlight Library at this point 
is besides everybody being so young and fresh and actually talking freely about stuff, that the age seems to have made making it more precious. Um, I was kind of wondering how George Bush would play here because it's a little, uh, I think I overdid, overdid a little bit George Bush, but you know, we were always kind of political. We were, you know, we had fun at that and you know, we lived through the Reagan years so we couldn't help but do that. Um, we love it, don't worry about it. Yeah, I know, it. I thought from yeah. Texas, this is okay, we're, we did okay. Before. I don't think anybody ever saw George Bush do that. <laughs> I think he was here earlier. Um, <laughs> so how, how mathematical would you get, like how surgical would you be in balancing your subcultures? Because you were talking about how omnivorous this was, in like seeking out all the different aspects of counterculture, subculture, all that stuff. But were you guys like consciously trying to balance, like oh, I've got to have a little bit of new wave here, a little bit of hardcore, a little bit of hippie stuff, or did you just really kind of go in openly like a buffet? Uh, well, remember it's before hip hop started, really. Right. So, I mean, and it's, I don't know, when you see this chocolate kind of pizza, it kind of looks part of me wants to cringe in one way, and, and it's sort of like such a historical look. And um, so we, we were clearly a, a white bread rock and roll station because hip hop hadn't really started yet. Um, but, um, you know, we, we got into the formula. We were really, on one hand, a music video, intelligent um, archives so of trying to put together thematic shows of music videos. And then the interviews really provided Remember, um, you know, MTV or, uh, never did a thematic approach to an artist in music videos. It was unheard of to actually do a half hour show and take all the music videos of one artist and put them together into a, a, a profile. So a, a lot of that was driven by that. And then the feature films was always kind of a, a whatever films that were really fell, fell into that. And I, you know, I think quite frankly, we, 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 there's probably about four or 500 films that could today make up the core of uh, what everyone would want to see on Nightflight, and hopefully over time we'll be able to acquire all those and get them into Nightflight Plus. Is there a good number of people in this room? I mean, I'm sure there's people that weren't watching the show from this first time because I'm seeing young human heads out here, but <laughs> is there the bulk of you, like, do you have memories of watching this late at night on syndicated television? Yeah. Is there a good number? I can't ask you all a question at once and get a little more answer, but did you feel like this actually shaped your interests and kind of set you on a path? Like, is that true? I mean, I, I, I'm seriously asking you. That's a huge deal. Like, to have an impact on, you know, at least 27 people like this. <laughs> it's really rewarding. You know, I think we all go through life trying to think whether we have it or whether we're worthy in our own eyes or surely in our parents' eyes or our father's eyes. And, um, Night Flight has really been, for me personally, rewarding for the response that I'm just now starting to get. But one of, one of the things that's the most interesting since we've started to relaunch it is um, how young a lot of the audience was when we were showing it. I mean, literally, every, every week I hear someone call me up and say, well, I, and I, whenever they, my phone, by the way, my cell phone is the, is the customer support on Night Flight Plus if you can't figure out how to turn it on or get your pants away. So I get these fucking calls once a day, you know, and I can't help anybody, but I want to talk to them, you know. <laughs> I don't know how to get my Roku on. I said, I really can't think that, but I can talk to you. And like, what do you like? And I ask everybody how old they are, you know, or what was it? And the thing that's amazing is I get, like, I was six years old, and I snuck out of my bedroom at night to watch it. Fucking six years old. So I'm thinking, you know, if we were at USA Network, really knew that we were playing the six and eight and ten year olds. You know, censorship would have gone out a long time ago. Six year olds love that bathroom <laughs> scene and Rude Boy. They love it. <laughs> but, you know, it's like one guy called me up from Miami, and he's the son of a famous artist, and, uh, and he said he was like six or seven. And the first thing he ever saw in his life when he turned on Night Flight was the residents. Yeah, yeah. And you know. And the good thing was, I mean, maybe I could, he wasn't high that night because maybe his life would have totally changed for life. But he said, the first thing I ever saw was a residence that changed my life. Yeah, I, honestly, I'm not saying this. The first thing I saw was the Constantinople video by the residence, followed by the short film uh, Bedhead by Robert Rodriguez. And that guy never made another movie, sadly. But, um, <laughs> but no, that was my earliest memory of Night Flight. I was like 10, 11, watching that. But, you know, the residents were, like, they were so special. Think about it.
about it. Yeah, they are. They are. And the, and the, they are. And it's, another thing that was so important about life, like I grew up in El Paso, uh, and that was the only program I had. And there's a fellow who was really a great site. And so the night flight was showing the stuff that you know, where I was a kid in some day, and we were watching the special night show, I didn't make my thing to look. But the night flight here, it just opened the door for me, and I never went to that. So usually the kids on the coast could absorb punks yeah, and all this stuff, but not you know, kids in Tulsa or El Paso. Or it, it's interesting. One of the other kind of identity um, statements that I get a lot is um, from some small town or in the Midwest or whatever. People say, you know, I knew I was different, but I was the only person like myself. And I was really worried that the rest of the world wasn't like this. It was like the world was flat. And then night flight came and I saw a new way of theater. And I, there's other people in the world like me. And it's kind of hard, you don't really think like that, but you know, there really are a lot of places that you may be really, I mean, not now, today, because we have been stuck the same, but back in the 80s, you could be an isolated individual and think that you were really different and that there was nobody like you. So that was a wonderful thing to be able to provide security to, to, uh, to uh, freaks that are individuals, <laughs> anarchists. We just, we just got the uh, polite signal, so let's do one more question. And you were the first guy here for the show. You were so excited to be here. Did it hold up? Are there any uh, licensing problems with all the episodes on that trying to follow up that is in terms of like, 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 yeah, Never going to make it on DVD. That's, that's not going to happen, not except for bootleg. You know, you can get all the bootlegs you want. That's, uh, that's flattering to me, quite frankly. Um, the, uh, there is li there's licensing issues for uh, streaming uh, of the feature films because you actually have to acquire them. And then the interviews we have all the rights to because we actually, we actually have it, all the artists sign that. And the music videos, we're working with the record companies to legitimately um, sort of um, send it to, be, to legitimately play them and make them our partners. And that's a process. Um, it's a little complicated because in the old days, the record companies gave us the music videos for promotion. And it was a promotional business of record companies and film companies. So it's like this sort of gray area where you gave it to me 30 years ago, why can't I play it now? But we're, we're going through that process. And, um, you know, as, as Nightplay grows and becomes more supportive, and I hope all of you out there go home and like support us because we do need the support in the Nightplay Plus we'll be able to have acquisition funds and be able to make it grow. And there is a, I mean, I, I just think that there's a, there's a great opportunity. It's not just for feature films, but there's a whole ton of TV shows from, the, from England that I really want to try to bring in. The young ones, the two, the there's really, uh, there's a lot of stuff we can do. And then there's a lot of new stuff I want to try to do. Once, you know, everyone sort of asked me to, to go back and perhaps do interviews with some of the artists and have them talk about the, the old days and then choose new artists. Um, so, and then I want to do some live streaming. Um, maybe, you know, do some comedy live stuff, but the, the world is open and, and hopefully we'll have a lot of fun. And licensing is um, usually a combination of success and having a, a platform where people want to be on. The good thing about Nightflight is it's, it's, it's endeared to everyone. So we're good guys. Okay. <laughs> Until I find a blowjob in a bathroom. <laughs> and you're going to do more shows like this. You're going to come back and do another show yes, like this. Yes, we're going to do. Yeah, we, um, we're we're going to tour this. And the other thing is really interesting. Just so you know, we're going to have a partnership with the Draft House. The Draft uh, House equals like, like same thing. So the videos that you see in a half hour beforehand. Uh, we're going to start working with the video department and we're going to put those videos on Nightflight Plus and actually provide to them some of our library so that they can put some of the content from MVD and our feature films and spaghetti westerns and the kind of stuff we have. So we'll upgrade. We're going to work with that. The other thing that I want to work with the Draft House is uh, when artists come and do question and answers, um, we want to try to get that, provide that content on Nightflight as well. So. We're looking for a really engaging partnership here. Thanks, everybody.
thank you a lot for coming out to the show, but also, more importantly, thank you for putting this stuff together and for being the pilot of this stuff for so many years and keeping it available, making it available again. So thanks a ton. And thank, you all. Oh, thank you all. Thank you all. Really, really. <laughs> And bring more beautiful talent to uh, to the, to the show. So thanks all. I fly class is really cheap, is it not? Yeah, because it's really it's two ninety nine a month or twenty nine dollars for the year. Um, yeah, really. That's cheaper than Mad Magazine subscription. So <laughs> it's actually probably less than you paid tonight for your tickets and your beer version. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys. Thanks, thanks everyone. So